Sakana AI has just dropped a potentially game-changing research paper called Continuous Thought Machine. This new AI model is inspired from actual biological processes, so compared to the current state-of-the-art AI, it addresses a key problem they all have, which is the inability to perceive time. So with this model they designed, which now has an internal clock, they were able to observe some fascinating emergent capabilities. For things like solving 2D mazes directly on a raw image, which basically means there are no positional hints, it can learn to train a path out by using its internal neural timing. On top of that, it can also generalize its maze solving capabilities to a larger scale, suggesting that it can build an internal spatial representation or even a world model really well, especially when all this was trained without giving any positional information. For image processing, this model would naturally take multiple steps to examine different parts of the image before making its decision, as you can see by the trace of the attention. What's even cooler is that the longer it thinks, aka the longer the internal clock goes, the more accurate its answers become. And even though this is not the state of the art, it is still a huge first step of bridging an actual biological inspired AI model into the field. And its performance is already really good for such a novel idea. And before I dive into this monstrosity of a model design and explain how it works, with today's video, we can already see that AI research is evolving at a mind-blowing speed. And one of the biggest worries right now is the AI agent powered data scraping economy. Data brokers have always been around collecting and selling personal information. But now with AI, they can scrape, analyze, and categorize more of your details faster than ever before. Your home address, phone number, even family connections, AI makes it easier for these companies to track and sell your data with almost no effort. So this is where Delete Me comes in. Instead of me needing to manually opt out from data brokers, Delete Me scans the web, actively submits removal requests, and continuously monitors to keep my data off these platforms. On my dashboard, Delete Me has shown me that they have scanned through 635 listings, and of course, there's no way I would opt out of them manually, especially periodically. On top of that, I will also get regular reports from Delete Me that show me where my data was collected and how it will help me remove them, visualizing its effectiveness nicely to you. So yeah, if you're serious about protecting your online privacy and want to keep your loved ones in the clear too because collecting data on your relatives has been easier than ever, definitely consider getting a family plan. You can start protecting your personal data with Delete Me by clicking the link in the description below and use the coupon code by cloud for 20% off. Don't wait until your personal data is exposed. And thank you Delete Me for sponsoring this video. Anyways, AI models that incorporate time are not something completely new. For recurrent neural networks, you can set it up to incorporate an internal time dimension that is separate from the data. And if you want to find papers like that, just check out my website findmypapers.ai. However, the CTM differs in two major ways. One is instead of using the conventional static activation functions, CTM has this complex learnable way that would also incorporate histories of activations which can produce complex neuron level activity. And two, when CTM is producing outputs, it is able to aggregate temporal relationships between the neurons. And saying that it is aware of time might be a bit inaccurate. It doesn't look at the time and decide, oh, it's time for some tea. But instead, it has an internal clock that ticks, which simply provides a way to track past generations. So this is how it can focus on different points of an image and improve its confidence in its predictions like how human attention works. And being able to design a model that is capable of this makes you want to take a closer look at how the AI model really works under the hood, right? Even if the design might look a bit scary. So I made a simplified version of it. And starting from the most basic, where does the input go? CTM is designed with a pretty flexible input mechanism which allows its core architecture to be applied across pretty much anything, as long as you can extract features from it. The raw input data would just need to be processed by a feature extractor module, and this could be a CNN for images or embedding layers for sequential data. After that, it'll pass through an attention layer to obtain QKV for the input, and this is where the chaos starts. In CTM, there are a certain number of neurons just like our brain, and this number can be set arbitrarily depending on your experiment size, which in the paper's case, they had between 128 to 4096 neurons for a model depending on the difficulty of the task they wanted it to solve. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just say there are four neurons for now. Another thing unique to CTM is that it has an internal clock, and that clock will have a base unit which we will refer to as a tick. Since an internal clock will always have to start, let's just say 4 ticks has already passed and we are on the 5th tick, also for the sake of simplicity. So that means the model has thought for 4 steps already. So this means the input attention, let's say an image, has already been looked at again for the 5th time. Since the input information has not changed so far, the same info will be sent to something called a synapse model. But before entering that model, the input attention will combine with the activations of 
the four neurons from tick four. Here, you can interpret activation as a neuron's thought or a signal or something as simple as a number. This synapse model then looks at every neuron's thoughts at tick four, compares the input attention with each of them, and generates something called pre-activations for every neuron. The synapse model basically just combines the insights from the signals of all the neurons generated in the last tick along with fresh new input information and redistributes them as a set of guiding signals for this new thinking tick. So the name synapse, which acts as a point of communication between neurons, suits well to what the model is doing here. This is also the only point that neurons would have their signals cross over because after this, all signals are processed in parallel. Next, the four pre-activations are passed to their own private model called a neuron level model. These are the four neurons which I've been talking about and they are composed of a pretty simple MLP. But aside from taking in the pre-activation that was generated by the synapse model, they also have a small memory that stores a limited history of the most recent pre-activations. Let's just say the memory spend is 3 ticks for now, once again for the sake of simplicity. And since the current tick is 5, the pre-activations from tick 4 and 3 will also be included when passed into the neuron level model. Tick 2's pre-activation will be kicked out here. Then each NLM will generate a post-activation, so 4 post-activations in total from 4 NLMs, which will be sent to the synapse model for the next tick. So basically, this small NLM processes a history of incoming signals uniquely to its neuron in order to determine its own activity level. It's kind of in a way mimicking individual biological neurons that can demonstrate more complex, diverse, and time-sensitive responses compared to the simple uniform activation functions that the typical AI model has right now. The post-activations of each neuron are stored too, this time without a memory limit and would undergo something called synchronization. In this step, the idea is to quantify how the activity patterns of neurons have changed over time compared to each other and then use that dynamic and temporal relationships to make decisions and attend to data. But for the sake of practicality, they couldn't really compare every neuron's activity with each other, so instead, they would artificially pair neurons up and compare their activation history. So for four neurons, we would get two pairs, and they would be evaluated for a synchronization score. This data would then be concatenated with other pair synchronization data to create this latent representation. The benefit about this synchronization step is that it allows the model to base its understanding on the evolving patterns of how the pairs have similar or different activities throughout the entire thought process, which is theoretically much better than just relying on their individual instantaneous states, leading to a more dynamic and potentially deeper representation of the information. The older signals from a neuron are also applied with a decay, so when their synchronization score is calculated, the CTM can learn whether to give more weight to their recent activity or to their long-term historical relationship, allowing the model to capture interactions occurring at different relevant timescales. Then, when this latent representation is made, this vector of teamwork scores is fed into simple, learnable linear layers that have been trained to recognize specific patterns within these scores, and one of these layers uses the patterns to generate CTM's actual output or prediction for the current tick, while another layer uses different patterns from a similar latent representation to create an attention query, which is cross-attention with the input data again, then sent to the next operation in the next tick. So when you run a CTM, you would define how many thought steps or ticks it goes for. And let's say you set it to 20 ticks, then you would get one output every tick. These 20 outputs at the end are then used to determine a single robust final prediction by looking across the entire thought processes. And yeah, that is the rough CTM model logic. To also tie up the loose ends, something we need to talk about is what happens on tick 1 as there is no historical information. Since the first tick wouldn't have a post-activation to refer to in the synapse model, and an NLM wouldn't have a history of pre-activations to look through, so alongside the synapse model, or the neuron level models, and the attention mechanisms, which are the major components that require training, these initialization values can be set and optimized during training for the task it is learning, which will be much better than using values that are randomly initialized. And yeah, that's it for a slightly technical breakdown of the model logic behind continuous thought machine. And if you enjoyed today's paper breakdown, you should definitely check out my newsletter where I cover the latest and the juiciest research papers. On there, I go over the papers that I might not have the chance to cover in videos, so if you don't want to miss out on some new cool cutting edge concepts, go sign up now. And again, thank you to Lead Me for sponsoring this video and check out the Lead Me with the link down in the description. And thank you guys for watching. A big shout out to Andrew Laschelius, Chris Ledoux, Degan, News Research, Kanan, Robert Zaviasa, Louis Muck, Ben Shaner, Marcelo Ferraria, Zane Sheep, Poof and Inu, DX Research Group, and many others that support me through Patreon or YouTube. Follow me on Twitter if you haven't, and I'll see y'all in the next one.